Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello, everybody. We are doing a mic check to make sure that the stream can be heard in all of the regions before we get going. So when you can hear my voice, I'm Mischievous Mole. If you could just stamp your feet, raise your hands, and count to five. There you go. All right. Welcome to the second in our series of SL21B Town Hall events. We had a great turnout yesterday for our inaugural event with the product and engineering team. Through the rest of the week, we'll be chatting with even more virtual world movers and shakers, including our very own moles on Friday. And tomorrow, we will be having a Q&A session with Second Life founder, Philip Rosedale. Also, next Monday, July 1st, we are excited to welcome Linden Lab Executive Chairman Oberwolf Linden and Senior Vice President of Product Operations and Marketing, Patch Linden, for our second Community Roundtable. Today's focus is on product operations which means we have several members of that team joining us to discuss a wide range of matters, including land, Linden Homes, governance, support, and much more. With us today, our Senior Vice President of Product Operations and Marketing, Patch Linden, Support Operations Manager, Kira Linden, Product Operations Manager, Derek Linden, and Creative Producer, Izzy Linden. Now, before we get to the community questions, what I would like to do is just go around and have everybody introduce themselves, um, tell us what it is you do at Linden Lab, and tell us what you love about Second Life or a funny experience that you've had in Second Life. Tell us a story. Patch, why don't we start with you? Oh my gosh, a story? We'd be here all day. Um, a short story? <laughs> I mean, I've been here for 17 and a half years, you know. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of stories. but So, yeah. Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm the VP of Product Operations and Marketing. Um, and I've been here over 17 and a half years. Uh, you know, I have lots of stories that I could tell. But, uh, you know, um, you know, my my favorite thing about Second Life is Second Life. It's, it's everything about it. And... Um, you know, our residents and, and everything that it stands for. Um, you know, there's there's no way I would still be here um, given the testaments and uh, trials and challenges and all of the good and bad and everything in between that has come with it over the years that I can stand here and firmly say, I just genuinely love it and I love our residents. Um, you know, there's nowhere else I think on earth that I could say that about. Uh, you know, um, I'm I'm kind of the other number two on the ship. You know, between myself and Grumpity, and you know, running Second Life with with Brad, along with all of my amaz amazing colleagues and Brett and uh, everyone we surround ourselves with. We work really hard um, to make Second Life um, be the best it can be and what it is. Well, I I think that. The people here today will agree with me when I say that we're very lucky to have you and very glad to be speaking with you and your team today. Kira, why don't you tell us about you? Sure. Um, I'm Kira. Um, I'm the uh, manager of our support operations team, which includes all of our uh, wonderful support uh, folks who, if you've ever had to contact us, You've spoken with one of them um, and also our governance team as well. Um, I started with Lyndon back in 2008 as a member of our concierge team, which is still around today in a different form, but it's still here um, and have kind of jumped around here and there um, and ended up where I'm at today. Um, I don't have a story. I mean, I have a lot of stories, but nothing that I can really tell. Um, but uh, my favorite thing is um, the communities and working with the communities and trying to find solutions to the problems that the communities are encountering as they're trying to build or grow um, or just kind of get set up. 
All right, so if I am in a community and I need help, you are the person that I want to come to and ask. <laughs> Depends on the issue. Um, being being over the support team and governance, I, as you can imagine, uh, am pretty busy. But um, if it's, you know, if you send in a support ticket and ask for help, depending on what it is, I might be able to help you with it, yeah. All right, Derek, you're up. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, so I'm Derek. Uh, I am the Senior Manager of Product Operations here at Linden Lab. Uh, I currently wear and have historically worn many hats in my role. Uh, currently, uh, I basically manage the Land Operations team, uh, the Skill Gaming team, and I also assist Patch with, uh, with wrangling all of our fine moles. Um, I've been here for about, uh, oh geez, quick math, 13 years. Uh, and yeah, as far as what I've learned, uh, what I love, uh, Kira actually stole my answer, but I'm still going to stick with it anyway. It, it's the community. Um, my team and I have the privilege to talk second life with various communities and individuals. Uh, and we really get a front row seat to the passion that every single one of these individuals have for second life. Uh, and it quite frankly fills me with pride uh, to be able to to work with these people and um, you know, it doesn't always work out to uh, it, to work with them directly, but usually it's 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 something that we can still uh, you know learn from and get new experiences from, and it's just a fantastic experience for me and my team to be able to work with these individuals. Thank you very much, and welcome. I'm glad you're here with us today. All right, Izzy. Last but not least, tell us about yourself. Well, thank you, Mischievous. Uh, I'm Izzy Linden. I've been here uh, like Patch over 17 years. Uh, as the creative producer, uh, it's kind of a fancy word for saying project manager of creative projects uh, with the moles. So like Derek, I work very closely with all of our Linden Department of Public Works, which is a joy to uh, juggle all the different things that we're doing. Uh, and for me, what I would say my favorite thing about dealing with Second Life and being a part of Linden Lab, like everybody else said, is the community. More specifically, a lot of times I get Second Life referred to as the internet in a virtual world. And I kind of view our community as somewhat the opposite of the internet in that the internet's anonymity allows people to say and do things they might not normally do. But in Second Life, the sense of community really shows and pushes forward this sense of empathy where on a daily basis, I see people speaking out for each other, supporting each other, helping each other out and building together. And I just am inspired every day by things that I hear and see our residents do and create. Well, it sounds like all of you have been here involved with Second Life and the lab for years and years and are very also invested in the communities that make up Second Life. And I think that we're very fortunate um, to have such a group of dedicated people leading all of this for us. So uh, let's get into some of these questions that the community put together for all of you. Before I actually start on the questions, I do want to invite anybody here in the audience today, if while we're going through questions, a question um, crosses your mind, please send it to Squeaky. He's up here on the stage. You can IM him and he will be taking questions. And as we have time, we'll answer those after we've gotten through the community questions that we already have. All right, so over the past week, we collected quite a few questions um, and among the hottest topics by far are land and Linden homes. So Patch, I'm gonna start with you. Evangeline Arcadia asks, can you update us on the plans to move forward with Linden homes? Are there going to be more premium themes planned or floor plans update, floor plan updates? Um, or is the focus now mainly on premium plus homes? And what is going to be the timeline for the transition from version one homes to the new Belisaria homes? 
Wow. That's a lot of questions kind of in one. It's like, it's like Evangeline knows me and she wants to know everything all at once and I'm not going to tell her or something. I don't know. Um, hmm. Well, let's start with, um, we've got plans to return to working on Linden Homes. Um, I know folks have kind of noticed that we pulled back a little bit and took a small break um, and hadn't done a whole bunch with them uh, in the very near recent past. Um, but our plan going forward and um, for the near future looks like uh, an update to adding more floor plans to the log cabins, um, a new multi uh, parcel size theme for regular premium um, Linden homes. So 512s and 1024s with different themes, um, as well as another premium plus theme. And those will, those will both be kind of, you know, full theme sets with multiple floor plans. Um, yeah. So I guess you could say we have a lot uh, of uh, plans uh, to roll out uh, quite a few uh, new and upcoming Linden Homes uh, floor plan updates and themes coming. Uh, as far as timeline, you know, uh, as you can probably guess, we're just getting started on um, talking about planning, scoping, uh, you know, the themes. Um, I might even be uh, here very soon reaching out for some uh, you know, community opinion on uh, potential weigh-in um, on some theme selections. Maybe we'll run some polling. I think that could be that could be fun uh, on the forums uh, and see what people think. Uh, I've seen some ideas going through there. I always see ideas going through there on the forums frequently. Um, and we'll maybe see if we can, uh, you know, make a theme dream come true. So we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll do some fun and exciting stuff with it, I think. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the next, uh, we'll call it six to 12 months um, will be pretty exciting. And we'll have quite a few things um, that are both in the works planned and up and coming uh, for, you know, the newer Linden homes. As far as transitioning off of the old Linden homes, that is something that is, you know, always on our minds and, and when to start that project and the right time to do so uh, is always under consideration. You know, it comes up every several months, every six months, you know, is now the time to do it? Is, you know, next month the time to do it? We're, we're always evaluating it. Um, and, you know, uh, the more time that goes on, the more likely it's getting closer. Um, you know, I don't have any um, hard or firm, you know, timeline commitment date or anything like that, that I think I want to pin us to. But, you know, if that were to also happen at some point within the next six months to a year in conjunction with these additional theme updates, which I think will really kind of give us a robust selection across the board of things to choose from, um, then, you know, I, I would say that that could be a likely scenario. So it sounds like we have a lot to look forward to in the next six to 12 months, definitely by next birthday. Yeah. All right, um, another question for you, Patch. Jordan McFarlane asks, is it possible or why can't we at this particular time get two standard premium homes on a single premium plus account? Would that be something um, that you would consider? Uh, it, it is, and and we've thought about it. You know, the 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 issue is, of course, home inventory first and foremost, um, and allowing people to have multiple homes at once would certainly factor into how much we have available to put out and for people to pick up for folks that don't even have homes, right? Um, you know, the other side of it is technical. Uh, the the Linden Home System, you know, as I think I've described in the past, uh, is kind of old and creaky. It's it's hard to work on, and uh, it 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 needs updating. Um, you know, uh, our various priorities and such uh, sometimes you know have us doing other things. Um, 
and at some point it will get attention and it'll be something that we would consider doing um, and or, you know, being able to mix and match uh, the, you know, like being able to pick, you know, like for premium plus people, you know, maybe they could have, uh, you know, two different size homes on two different size parcels or something of that nature. Um, kind of like what you can do right now with mixing and matching, you know, mainland and Linden homes together because you can do that today. Uh, but as of right now, Mostly the barrier is technical. It's just not possible uh, without some significant engineering time and work on the software that drives the system. Okay. And th there's one more question specifically about Linden Homes um, from Whisperwood Snowpaw. And they ask, are there any plans on making more diverse plot sizes with existing Belisarian homes? Um, she would love uh, 2048 square meter treehouse with all the prims that she can use to spruce it up in the neighborhood of her choosing. Um, potentially, uh, we have thought about it. The uh, you know, the biggest consideration for us is to not create, um, you know, a, a, a whole bunch of things to choose from. Right, we want to kind of keep the selection clean and simple and easy to understand. And so the way the system is organized now is, you know, premium plus parcels. It's always implied that all types of those homes, you know, are grouped by theme. Um, and then you pick a floor plan and then that's applied to the parcel uh, and or you can then change that with the, um, you know, the mailbox or the home selector on each of the parcels, you know, but that's all grouped into the 2048 package for that particular theme. And, you know, for us to kind of like change that around or make it more universally available and such would probably introduce a lot of confusion. Um, and so we're a little, you know, wary of, um, you know, uh, being able to say, oh, you can put a tree house in 2048s without spinning up an entire area of 2048 tree houses, if you kind of understand what I'm saying. Um, so it, uh, um, it's, it is something we've thought about. Um, and, you know, we'll consider uh, and, and continue to think about it, but, uh, you know, in, in the, and in for the sake of, um, you know, trying to keep things balanced and easy to understand and, you know, maybe even a little bit on the simpler side, um, you know, we tend to shy away from introducing too many options. Makes sense. Have to have some continuity in the landscape, but, you also left it open saying that it's something that you're considering. So that's encouraging. Um, there is a question here about possible plans to give 10K regions. Many people would like the option to upgrade homesteads from 5K to 10K. Is that something that has ever been considered? We've, we've considered this too. Um, in fact, we just talked about it fairly recently. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much more about it at the moment. Um, I don't want to get people's hopes up. I don't want to tease anything here. Um, but it is still something that we're, you know, actively considering the implications, um, you know, and the impacts to the land economy, the balance, the costs and everything, you know, have, uh, second life changing consequences. Right. And that's something that we have to very carefully consider. You know, I think in the past when when we've actually been in these and talked about, um, you know, other changes to pricing and premium account changes and things of that nature, you know, um, I think I've always expressed um, I, I'd like to take a very cautious and extremely thoughtful, slow approach to you know making considerations when we're thinking about a change like that and you know sometimes it comes out on the other end that um i've deliberated it to the point of no we shouldn't do it um or you know what hey there's you know uh enough reward to the risk right um and that of course has to be reward not just to you know, Second Life, because Linden is a business and everything too, but also for, you know, the residents and you guys, right? And the communities and everything. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it from you, you guys and your lens first. And I want to make sure that it's something that isn't going to break, you know, what you do, 
Um, you know, so when I think about, you know, uh, region rentals and parcel rentals and, you know, uh, folks who do that sort of stuff with land and second life, um, you know, I have to, I have to consider them and their businesses and content creators and, you know, the whole gamut. That's, and that's, I guess, why I started with, I have to consider that this is a second life changing thing. So that's, I think, where I'll leave it <laughs> for the moment. Um, but know that, yeah, I'm always actively thinking about, you know, ground level product changes that, you know, might look like that. All right. Thank you very much for the answers. Um, I'm going to give Derek a chance to weigh in on some things now about PBR and how it's affecting mainland. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, the first one is mainland is really dark with the release of PBR. And do you have any plans to address that? Oh, man. Uh, so PBR is obviously a hot topic right now, uh, especially over the last week. Um, and the answer is, uh, quite frankly, yes. Um, we are currently in the process of uh, basically providing a, a resolution for, for this specific complaint. Uh, I don't want to give a specific timeline, but we are talking likely a matter of uh, days as opposed to weeks. Uh, so uh, I'm not promising, you know, this week, but uh, we should have a resolution to this uh, relatively soon. And we certainly hear the the concerns here. All right. Thank you for that update. Um, the other question about mainland is, uh, do you have a timeline for 2K GLTF materials on mainland? I know we talked about this. Well, we tried to talk about it a bit yesterday with engineering, and they said, well, <laughs> product operations can answer that question. <laughs> uh, is there another team that I can pass this question <laughs> off to? Uh, no, but seriously, um, yes, we are We are talking about it. Uh, I, I, this is something that I cannot give a timeline for. This is going to be a uh, a longer tailed project that we we are discussing how to take under our wing. Um, the the problem here is kind of technical limitations uh, in addition to figuring out the best solution forward. Uh, if we were to do some sort of uh, you know mass update across the land uh, to update the the terrain textures, um, quite frankly, it it may not have the the best result. Um, the alternative is fixing these by hand or a, a semi-automated approach, um, which is probably a better option, but also is going to be incredibly time consuming to roll out uh, across the hundreds, thousands of mainland regions. Um, so we are discussing it. We are uh, attempting to find the best approach that is going to have the least impact on residents. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just a matter of making those decisions before we can move forward with it talking about well it makes sense to me that you want to carefully plan this out before you do it because no matter what it's going to be a pretty big job because mainland is pretty big continent so it's great to hear that you guys are actively thinking about this and we have 2k textures to look forward to on mainland 2k pbr textures all right well Let's shift to something a little bit more spicy. Um, Derek, you're on the hot seat again. <laughs> Henry Beauchamp. On me at this point. Yes, Henry Beauchamp asks. In 2023, Linden Lab announced, "quote We are turning attention to the spicier side of Second Life with some bold and innovative new adult-friendly initiatives." As an adult user of Second Life, I do feel very much ostracized and would very much like to see Zindra get some more love from the moles, um, especially getting it moved closer to the rest of the grid and linked via an adult channel to the rest of the SLCs. Is there any hope to see this happening? 
Uh, it's not something that we've considered up to this point. Uh, it is certainly uh, a, a decent idea and something that we can consider. Um, however, that being said, uh, and I don't want to disappoint anybody out there, but uh, currently uh, we do not have any current plans to, uh, to expand on the Zendric continent. Uh, however, there are a lot of very interesting things about uh, the spicy side, adult, uh, that I actually would be speaking out of turn on, so I'm actually going to uh, turn this over to Patch. Well, sure. Is this where I, like, make my joke about, like, Second Life turning 21 now? <laughs> this would be the perfect time. <laughs> All right. Well, like, here we go. So, in the background, um, and as we've kind of alluded to before, you know, we've been considering and thinking about other spicy like initiatives uh, and such. And, you know, our our mission has, you know, consistently been to try to foster opportunities for creators, you know, including those in the adult content community. You know, and since the launch of Zindra and Horizons, we've been exploring ways to serve and expand our community of creators. Uh, and folks interested in mature content. So, um, in alignment with that mission, um, I'm just going to kind of say that uh, we have a new project that is an initiative that aims to streamline the onboarding process for new Second Life residents interested in adult content to come into Second Life. Um, uh, it will consist of a new adult centric welcoming experience. Um, it will introduce them to mature content. It will, um, you know, primarily focus on helping acclimate them to, uh, the platform. It, uh, you know, is a work in progress. We've got quite a bit to do here. Um, it along with our other various projects, um, has, quite a few different, um, you know, uh, features to it that include um, community, um, living spaces, uh, commercial environments, um, continental size land masses. It's a whole new look and feel and approach to a new way that we might think of having adult community in Second Life. So we're going to, over the next, we'll call it six to eight months, be working on this in the background and you'll hear more about it in the future. Um, but we're super excited that uh, um, we're getting to do this uh, this particular project. Um, and I, th I think folks are going to love it. Um, it, uh, it will be, um, you know, uh, an approach unique to its own, um, and folks both new and old, um, I think will be able to come in and enjoy, uh, adult content in a new environment and setting that I think will be very fitting for it. So stay tuned. There'll be more to come in the future. All right, well, you have teased us very well, Patch. <laughs> I'm very expectant now to see what the future holds for the adult community in Second Life. All right, um, moving on to governance and support. Your team has a lot of direct community interactions related to matters of both support and governance. So naturally, there is a lot of curiosity about past, present, and future policies in these areas. Let's dive into a series of questions tackling all aspects of governance and support. And Kira, I am going to direct these questions to you since this is your area of expertise. Um, awesome. are, are <laughs> Are a resident ask 
<laughs> what is being done to educate the governance team about symbols and phrases used by far right groups so that governance can more effectively remove hate from Second Life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so our extremely hardworking governance team um, does all that they can to stay up to date with emerging trends, language, symbols, everything that could run afoul of our terms of service and community standards. And some of those ways is, you know, obviously going out and doing the research um, themselves if it's something that, that we're not familiar with or something that we haven't seen before. Um, we can collaborate with other experts in the field, um, such as going to, you know, seminars or conferences, um, things like that to kind of keep our knowledge up to date. Obviously, um, we are relying on in-world abuse reports from you all when um, something pops up. Um, if we're not familiar with it from your report, um, they'll go hop out and go research it, share the information among the team, and um, you know, kind of keep each other up to date in that way. So it's it's difficult to kind of keep up because there's lots of corners of the world that we don't see pop up very often. Um, so doing that research and having some tools available that help us get that information is, is really an essential part of their, their work. Well, it sounds like you are very proactive in staying on top of this. And that's very, it should be very reassuring to the community that you are constantly updating yourselves and educating yourselves about possible ways that people can communicate hate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, and you know, a lot of it is context based too, you know, what's, what's hateful to one person may not be hateful to another. So um, it's, it, it can sometimes be pretty tricky. So um, having, having that information and knowing what's going on and the context that's being used is super important. Well, I want to thank anarchism enthusiast for asking that question. I needed a moment to <laughs> pronunciate the name. I wanted to say it correctly, but thank you for submitting that question. It was a good one. Um, Kira, another resident to ask, can you provide more specifics on governance tools and tactics? For example, they're asking about content monitoring tools and how that works. Okay, so some of you have probably heard me say this before, but the short answer is no. Um, we don't discuss the tools um, or the mechanisms that governance uses um, during investigations or you know things like that. Um, those are proprietary, proprietary, and um, if we let all the secrets out of the bag, it would be super hard to catch people doing the things um, that they shouldn't be doing in Second Life. So most of that is kept um, kept private. Um, the longer answer is that um, if we, you know, uh, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, I know, so I know I created a stir when I mentioned automated moderation tools a few weeks back, um, and I can elaborate on that part a little bit more. We are currently looking at several products and companies that are in the content moderation space um, who built these tools to see if they would fit with our needs, what the governance team needs, what the company needs, and what the community needs. There's nothing radical about it, um, but it is a, it is necessary to look at ways to make moderation of really egregious content as automated as possible. Um, and I'm talking about that content that is in clear violation of terms of service, potentially violates laws outside of Second Life as well. So we're still in that evaluation process. Um, we're looking at those companies. We're asking them a lot of questions. Um, and while I understand there's some concerns about, you know, how, how those tools are gonna to be used. These are just gonna be another tool that help us get through abuse reports a little bit faster um, and re removes that offending content a little bit sooner. Both things that are very helpful to the residents. To For know sure. that you're gonna be able to get through abuse reports more quickly is, is always gonna be a good thing. Ab absolutely. One more question for you, Kira. Um, will there in the future be a place that ordinary users, 
I'm assuming that means basic users, can go to complain about real estate agents that are not treating their tenants fairly. So and that can get tricky, right? Because it, when you are renting a piece of land from somebody else, that's an agreement between you and the person that owns that land, right? Or that is subleasing that land. Um, Lyndon is not a part of that agreement that the two of you are settling on. Um, and it's, it's kind of gets into a, you know, you said, I said kind of a situation, um, when there's no proof of, of, you know, what happened there, what the actual agreement was or what the intent was behind that. So in terms of governance actions, there's very little that we can do in those cases. Um, but, you know, having said that there may be something that we can do, um, if it is super egregious, um, and also, you know, it's good to let us know if there's something like that going on, because we might then be able to reach out to the, you know, estate owner and find out what's going on um, and no, at least look into it to see if there's anything there that it, maybe we need to talk to somebody about. So I have a question. Um, when, when should a person come to support and file a ticket if if they have i mean i know that there are abuse reports that people can file if they feel like they're being harassed or something like that that's a good example of when to file an abuse report if they have dealt with something like this real estate and they feel that it's been dealt with unfairly is the best thing to do just file a support ticket and you you might not be able to do anything, but that's their best recourse? Yeah, so obviously if it's a clear violation of the terms of service or the community standards, we want to get that abuse report. Um, that's kind of our, our evidence, our first piece of evidence in launching an investigation. So it's, it's super important that that report comes in with, you know, all the right information we need um, in order to fill that out. <clears throat> um, in terms of, you know, if it's, you know, super egregious and, and somebody was just scammed for a bunch of linen dollars, um, you know, maybe maybe a quick support ticket in, we can take a look at it. Um, you know, the support teams all talk to each other. Um, so if somebody gets a ticket like that, they'll probably ping me and they'll say, hey, you know, what's, just want to let you know this, I got this in. Um, there may not be anything we can do about it, but it's always good for us to have that knowledge and that information because we don't see everything that happens in Second Life. So um, having having somebody come in and, and give us a heads up on uh, as to what's going on is super helpful. Now, the other thing that that I think would be helpful to you um, would be when someone has an issue with with somebody else two residents have an issue and say that it's harassment or something and the one resident is like i really don't like this i'm just going to leave and they log out of second life or whatever but they don't ever file an abuse report mm -hmm. they just walk away that's not incredibly helpful to you, right? Because nothing can be done about that other person and their actions to to anybody if people don't file abuse reports every single time something right. like that happens. Right. So in order for us to go out and you know launch that investigation, we have to have that abuse report. Like I said, that is our first piece of evidence that, that something was happening, whether, you know, what's what's happening that's in the ticket is going on, we'll find that out later. But that's our first step into seeing that something's going on. If no reports get sent in, we have no visibility into what's going on. We don't know that there's a problem. Um, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, see something, say something kind of thing. You know, if, if somebody is violating terms of service, community standards, absolutely send in the um, the abuse report so that we can look into it. And it's also going to be cumulative, right? So that if someone is a continuous offender, it's helpful to you to see that as opposed to someone just sending something in and saying, well, this person has been harassing me for a year. Well, if you've never received anything about that, it doesn't help. It depends on the circumstances. But but yeah, if, we, if we've never received an abuse report about a situation, we're just we're not going to know that there's anything going on. Okay. 
All right, Patch, one for you. Um, there has been a lot of community discussion lately about account sharing and business use. Can you talk a little bit about that and what's been happening? Yeah, so I know that this has kind of come up recently, um, you know, and a little bit of a historical perspective on it um, because it, it's something that we've, um, you know, uh, been aware of have had challenges with and uh you know uh, have consistently applied policy on over the years um you know the, the 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 policy in the terms of service you know generally outlines that you know you shouldn't share your account with another individual right it's just to simplify it um you know we think of your account as something sort of like a financial instrument right you know your account has financial data on it and it has access to you know your billing and payment methods and it has the ability to spend money and it has the ability to throw your money out the window <laughs> as it were um and do damage right like unrecoverable irreparable damage like permanent like we couldn't recover your inventory sort of thing if they you know delete it and then really delete it and empty your trash can type damage um, so, you know, we're, 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 we're as protective about your accounts as, as we can be. And, you know, over the years, um, you know, our process and policy and the way we've handled, um, you know, account sharing, uh, you know, is something that we've actually been thanked for many times. Um, I can recall several key cases where uh, you know, unfortunate circumstances and situations have happened where, uh, you know, something has gone wrong, right, with a business relationship. And we'll notice something has gone, you know, a direction it shouldn't, and things suddenly change or have happened with somebody's account. And, you know, we take the best precautionary stance and measures we can to try to protect, you know, you and your account. Um, and so, you know, we, um, you know, try to do the best we can and have tried to do the best we can with that situation. Um, but, uh, you know, um, we've heard the call, right? And uh, perhaps times have changed. And, um, you know, uh, I think we're amenable to change. And I think, you know, Kira, you might have some additional information to share about that. I do. Um... One thing I'm hoping I'm getting across to people is that I, I am the kind of person who likes to question processes, um, even ones that have been, you know, ingrained for a very long time. Um, I like to reevaluate processes. Are they still working for us? Are they working for you all? Um, you know, is it outdated? Does it need to be updated? Um, unfortunately, those can sometimes take a long time. Um, there's a lot that goes into creating a new process. Um, that is totally in opposition to the way that we've operated in the past. So it takes some time. I talk to a lot of teams. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of residents. Um, we have to get, you know, legal involved. We've got to get product involved. Everybody's involved in this process. So um, I, I take those, those kinds of things really seriously and put a lot of time and thought into it, into what is the best way to make this happen. And that's why it always seems like it might take quite a while to get there. But... I can tell you with, with this particular issue, it is going, it is getting there. Um, I'm in the process of kind of reviewing our wiki pages of knowledge-based articles that touch on account sharing um, and seeing what we can do to set up the best and easiest process for everybody to do something like this. You know, like, like Patch said, my biggest concern um, is, is fraud, right? We want to protect your financial interests. Um, and sometimes, you know, that person that you've known in Second Life for a really, really, really long time and you trust them implicitly, sometimes they run off with your Linden dollars or, you know, do other bad things. And it, that makes it really difficult for us to then help you and kind of, you know, fix that situation if accounts are being shared. So it, it, it takes a little bit. It takes a lot of careful planning to make sure that, that we're doing the right thing for everybody involved. Um, but uh, it is definitely being worked on. Okay. 
can Linden Lab institute a policy that finally addresses blatant content theft and sales? Um, DMCA filing is a powerful tool, but can Linden Lab consider a beyond a reasonable doubt option that doesn't require people to have to go the legal route to stop bad faith creators? Yeah, so this one can get kind of tricky. Um, as you can imagine, if we have two or more people coming to us saying that they are the original creator of a piece of content, it can be really difficult to determine who the actual creator is. Um, but because um, intellectual property is protected by law through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, we have to follow legal guidelines in those instances. Um, so if you feel someone has violated your copyright or otherwise copied your content, we really have to have you fill out um, the form. Oh, let me grab it. I had it here a second ago. Um, the form here. Um, and we have a special team that reviews those and helps you with the next steps um, going through that process. Um, now, I will say that in a very, very, very few cases, it may be more apparent that content is being actively copied. Um, and that we we may, and that is like a really, really tiny may, have the ability to do something in those cases. But that is highly, highly, highly unusual. Um, and so the best way to, to go about getting that looked at is to fill out that DMCA form if you find that you have uh, content that's out there copied. All right, so the best best way to deal with any content copying really is to file that DMCA mm -hmm. and get that on file with you. Right, right. Because then that starts the, the tracking um, and can we can actually start like legal. Well, we don't start it, but it gets you into that um, that legal process of how you protect yourself, not only in Second Life, but also out in the, the rest of the digital world. Final question for you, Kira, from mm -hmm. Bob Iwashi. Um, he asks, with Second Life having a worldwide user base, why isn't support open 24 seven, including US public holidays that the rest of the world doesn't celebrate? So, okay. So support is reachable via support ticket 24 seven. Um, I know that's not what the question is, but I do want people to know that there, you can always submit a support ticket um, and we also have um, Boxy on the support portal that can answer some very basic questions for you if you have, you know, easier questions. Uh, the hours for our live chat and phone support, um, they're restricted to the current hours after we evaluated the most popular times that were in use. You know, a long, long, long time ago, we were 24-7, um, seven, you know, seven days a week, always open. We had people, you know, across the world um, staffed into it, um, and times have changed and the support needs have changed as well, um, as we have made lots of improvements to Second Life since I started back in 2008. Um, and with all of those improvements comes less and less need for support. So that means that we then can adjust our hours down to be, um, you know, when we have the most um, traffic coming in via live chat or phone calls. And so that's how we came up with the current set of hours that we have. Um, regarding holidays, um, you know, we we made the deliberate decision to grant um, certain members of our support team time off on U.S. holidays to kind of you know spend that time with their families and promote a healthy work-life balance. That's super important to us. Um, but the helm is not left unmanned. Even when we blog that live chat and phones are not available, um, it's just that we're not staffing for those particular areas of support on those days. Okay, so if somebody has a problem, they should file a ticket and they will get a response. Absolutely, yes. All right, one more question um, to Derek. Have a question about asking, how does the lab go about ensuring that charity events held in Second Life are honest and transparent? For example, um, do you in how do you ensure that fundraising goes to the intended cause or organization? 
Ooh, this is an interesting question. Um, yeah, so we actually have two kind of levels of the way that we work with uh, individuals that are raising funds for uh, charitable organizations. Um, the first and the highest level, of course, is those that we have developed partnerships with. Uh, so think uh, our work with the American Cancer Society uh, and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, we've got a, a partnership and, and uh, agreements uh, set in place with them on, on how they can operate and how we can support them in doing so. Um, the kind of lower uh, lower tier is the uh, individuals that are interested in raising funds inside of Second Life, which is a, a fantastic cause. Um, we uh, are pretty limited on what we can do unless we start talking partnerships. Uh, basically, we have to limit it to allowing them to list their uh, list their fundraisers on the destination guide, um, which we do assist with. Uh, what we do in those processes is we uh, basically verify any past fundraisers that they have done uh, for the last several years, uh, or in some cases, we work with the individuals to, uh, if they are working directly with the charitable organization, basically getting verification that they are uh, working with them and have uh, expressed an intent to do so. Um, so there's a, a couple of options there, but uh, for anything that is being listed in the destination guide specifically, those are being verified that they are uh, legitimate uh, fundraising events and that those funds are making it to the intended charities. Uh, and then we continue to uh, verify those after the event has been completed. Is there a place that lists the verified charities that um, Second Life works with? Uh, there's not an official place, no. Um, officially, we only have partnerships in place with the American Cancer Society uh, through the Relay for Life uh, program, uh, and then, of course, the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, we don't have a blanket list just because having a, a list of charities that people donate to doesn't necessarily get the information that uh, give the information that the person or individual resident that is raising the funds uh, is actually doing what they state. Uh, so anything that you see that's not listed on the destination guide uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it has not, uh, it, that they're not donating the funds to the intended purpose or stated purpose. Uh, they just haven't gone through the process, but anyone that is listed on there, uh, you can rest assured that we have done our homework on making sure they are uh, taking the funds and, and giving them to where uh, it is stated that they are doing so. Okay. Um, Catch, I don't have a question so much as a comment from a resident about the economy and some of the events that residents are planning that affect the economy, specifically the weekend sale events. And this person feels that they are negatively impacting the economy. Weekend sale events encourage um, creators to sell their items at a fraction of the realistic price just to stay relevant and cover business expenses from land fees to mesh upload costs. Do you have a comment about that? Well, I mean, if if what's being suggested is that weekend sales, like the weekend sale events, I've seen you know like the 50 Linden weekend sales and 100 Linden dollar weekend sale events are bad for the economy. Um, I can't say that I, you know, have seen a detrimental effect on the economy itself. Um, as far as like even at the content creator level, I mean, I could see that being competitive um, and potentially causing. Um, you know, some interesting, you know, competition, uh, the, you know, the, the, the downstream effects of that though are probably undervaluing product. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, right? Because, um, I don't, I don't think that that's something that, like, that we would reach our hands in and say, you know, you shouldn't do this. You know, there's various things that have happened over time and in the history of second life that we've had to, you know, 
come in and make policy against him, such as gambling um, and, and other other things, banks being another one in the past, you know, that, that have had, you know, clear and present danger type legal ramifications. Um, but, you know, in a free market, free trade economy, um, you know, where supply and demand is, you know, virtually in a way, uh, a thing, um, you know, of its own, uh, kind of its, uh, its own unique way, um, you know, underpricing things with weekend sale events, um, you know, I can't, I can't say that that's something that we would want to reach in and stop and or comment and say like it's overtly negative or anything like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll give it some more thought. Okay. Izzy, it, you have been very, very quiet. So I, I feel like I really need to ask you a question. Oh no, you saw me. <laughs> the, the, from a resident recently visiting the Welcome Hub, they saw the community exhibition area and some of the larger areas look unused. Are there plans for that area? And how would someone, a community, go about applying to be a part of the community exhibition? It's a great question. Uh, some of the Second Life Community Exhibition is intended to put great communities on display for our new residents. It's kind of a passion project for me. To date, we've got uh, two phases totaling 22 exhibits, and we're actively working on our phase three, which is going to include those 10 largest uh, exhibit spaces that you mentioned. Uh, after completion of phase three, we're going to begin to cycle in and out new exhibits uh, to keep the exhibit area fresh. Uh, with this new phase, we're also going to include a gift spire that will allow new existing and also previous uh, exhibitors to leave free gifts for our resident. So definitely keep an eye out for that gift spire. Uh, if you're interested in applying to have your community host an exhibit, please fill out our application. There are boards uh, at the community exhibit that you can click on to do so. And I'll also put it here in local chat, the link to go ahead and do so. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for telling us about that. Um, I I know that when you started working on it, we were looking at communities that had come here to the Second Life birthday in past years. And so people here, if, if you have a community at the birthday, you might want to go check out the community exhibition at the Welcome Hub and see if you want to apply to take up space there. Absolutely. All right. I have one more question before we jump into audience questions. And Patch, you haven't said anything about lifetime premium accounts this year. Are there going to be any? Ooh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know. We may have to just come to Friday's mole town hall to find out more and the number 21 might be involved Ooh, now we have an even bigger reason to come on friday not just the moles but impending announcements from patch all right these are questions from the audience. So I'm going to go through these and we'll see how many we can get through. Patch, Teresa Firelight asks, will you consider allowing the plus members to get a 512 Linden home with their land allowance? Uh, we have considered this. We considered it both with the, you know, kind of the design of the, you know, value incentives of the, the you know, plus product, you know, the premium account product itself. Um, and we've, you know, relitigated it since then. And, um, you know, right now, uh, no, I don't, I don't think we, we will probably for the, for, you know, for the, for the nearer future. Um, this also probably has to do with what we may consider doing post old Linden homes wind down. Um, and getting past that and what may come next. So I don't want to say much more beyond that. Now that the eight 
connected continents can all be traveled to by sea. Are there plans to connect the eight continents together with a road and bridge or tunnel network? Because lots of people have cars and GTFO game is a thing. Again, Patch, this is for you. Oh, is this for me? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, actually, you know, I was just thinking about this. Um, we will install a brand new shiny multi-lane tollway that will take you from one end to the other. Um, and we will make it so easy. We'll install like the latest and greatest toll pass system so that, you know, we can just kind of direct bill your account for every time you drive up and down the, the expressway um, and to pay for um, all of the mole time and everything like that and the infrastructure work and, you know, laying of the, the foundations and the pylons and the and the concrete roadbeds and painting the stripes, all of that stuff, right? Building, you know, these beautiful big toll plazas, you know, we've got to have the dollars to do this. So I think the plan to go forward is, is we will have, you know, the mole expressway pass, um, you know, for the new tolling system to go forward and it'll be glorious. Sounds like a great idea. I can't wait to be the first person on the toll roads. All right, Senna, Senna Astorius asks a very, very important question here. And this is to each and every one of you. What are your favorite pizzas? So we'll start with Izzy. <laughs> Izzy, what's your favorite pizza? Pepperoni, sausage, and mushroom. Derek. Oh, I'm gonna say something controversial. Hawaiian. I, I'm I'm a big fan of pineapple on pizza. So am I. I never have pizza without pineapple. Um, Kira. Um, I like veggie, but only if the veg is fresh. I don't like like canned or jarred vegetables. Those are gross. Um, but veggie and sausage. Okay. And Patch, what kind of pizza do you like? I am taking yours and Derek's pizza cards away because pizzas are not designed to be fruit salads. Um, and I am going to go with pepperoni. So we have pepperoni, sausage, and pineapple. And we'll throw in green peppers for Kira. Next question um, from Sammy Huntsman. Will there ever be multiple partner lines for those in poly relationships? Ooh. Um, can I answer this one? Was this for me? Can yes, you? please. Um, so we have, we have and had and uh, talked about a small project to update um, you know, the partnership thing in our profiles. Um, and this was absolutely part of it and being able to create like flexibility around what you can choose and have for, um, your partners, uh, and such, and, you know, being able to have multiple partners to serve this particular need, uh, specifically a use case and as many as you, you know, potentially could use. Um, so yes, I don't have a timeline. Um, it's not, you know, something that's currently like sitting right at the top of the things that, you know, are being done. Um, but uh, it is certainly something that um, has gotten attention. It has actually been designed. Uh, and uh, I hope it'll get some some work done on it by engineering and products soon. Very cool. Another question for you, Patch. Um, will SL ever support more than two genders? Uh, so this kind of um, was was an aside of that, actually, interestingly, that these got asked one after the other. Um, and and even like when we went back and looked at, like when we were working on Senra and, you know, kind of coming up with the concept for that, we actually, the, the very first thing I remember this very vividly said as one of the project missives was, break the old Second Life Avatar skeletal system and redo it so that we can basically be unchained from the bounds of having gender. Um, <laughs> of course, as the engineering and 
such discussions progressed from there, the um, implications of how massive and impactful of a change that would be um, and the amount of work it would take to do that, you know, um, presented, you know, many hurdles, roadblocks, speed bumps um, to accomplish that. So Senra itself at that point, then, you know, to get Senra to move forward as a project, we had to make a departure and say, okay, well, if we want Senra and to accomplish the goals of Senra, we just have to move forward with the project from a content perspective and continue to use the old skeletal system. The notion that we want to do that though, um, you know, remains and it is going to take, you know, a new skeletal system. Um, my idea and my proposal and recommendation was, was to kind of create a, you know, a secondary or a new generation, right? Avatar skeletal system that, you know, you could choose or opt to use, um, you know, and switch between old and new. That way we don't break any existing, pre-existing content. So you can either be in, you know, old Ruth, you know, based skeletal system, or you could switch to new generation, right? Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully at some point, um, maybe after all the GLTF stuff and PBR and uh, these creator tools and such kind of proceed, um, we'll see a return back to doing some avatar uh, and skeletal work. It's exciting. All right, um, still have a few more questions here and still have a little bit of time. So Izzy, I think that this question is definitely for you. How many Lindens does it take to screw in a light bulb? Ooh, real serious question. Well, I will go ahead and answer that question just as seriously and say that as a Linden, I can't screw in a light bulb, but that's what I have moles for, like you, mischievous. <laughs> so are we going to get this question asked again on Friday? How many moles does it take to screw in a light bulb? That's entirely possible. <laughs> we might even have a poll. All right, Derek, um, one for you from Kat Ubel. Is there any plan to redistribute the parcels labeled as abandoned lands? And will there be new ways to, new ways of claiming lands that are empty on mainland? Uh, the short answer is uh, yes, in terms of new ways of claiming land. Um, so obviously we are well aware of the abandoned land on on mainland it is uh there's plenty of it quite frankly uh we as a team are frequently discussing kind of how we can tackle that uh because of course you don't want to remove the uh the human element uh from a, a resident abandons a parcel to uh, the land team then going and cleaning up the parcel and then getting it back uh, sold to another resident. Uh, it's very important that we have that human element because if we remove that element, then there will be absolute chaos. Um, the land team performs a very essential service uh, in what they do in cleaning up and making sure that the, uh, the mainland stays as nice as we can make it. Um, the... <sighs> We are discussing and uh, experimenting with ways that we can get this abandoned land back into the hands of residents more easily. Uh, one of the challenges that we're constantly facing and constantly talking about is how do we get that land back into the hands of residents as quickly as possible. Uh, for example, one of the experiments that we're currently running is uh, we are taking land and instead of doing our normal process of uh, allowing residents to uh, request it as abandoned land or putting it in auction, we're actually just cleaning up the land and setting it for sale to anyone at reasonable prices and then keeping an eye on it to uh, check and see uh, whether or not selling, if not take the price down uh, and, you know, consider basically what we can do to make that land more attractive. So we are constantly thinking about it and we are experimenting with ways uh, to make it a little bit easier for uh, for residents, but also for new residents uh, to be able to obtain land without disrupting the entire uh, economy of land sales and uh, land rentals. 
Okay. Thank you. Kira, I have some questions for you. Um, <laughs> I just keep circling around. When will Second Life update the report abuse on viewers with a video option? I wish it was um, I wish it was possible to add YouTube videos because it gives more proof when the person is on voice or hutting someone. So that one's another tricky one because um, editing video editing tools exist. Um, we cannot action anything that goes on outside of Second Life because we cannot guarantee the authenticity of what we're looking at in those videos. Um, so that's, you know, it, and we have people who send us YouTube videos and we, we see it, we, we can see it, but we don't know, we can't, like I said, we can't verify that it's authentic and that what we're seeing in that video is actually what went on with that person. So that's an, an unfortunate, um, you know, side effect of, of us not being able to do anything there. Um, we have some other things that we are considering um, when it comes to, uh, you know, moderation. I mentioned moderation tools earlier. Um, there's there's a few things, a few tricks in there um, that we are considering um, as well to kind of help with situations um, where uh, I, I'm trying to be really cryptic again cryptic about this on purpose because I can't really talk about it too much and we haven't signed anything either. So it, it, we're looking at different ways to help us with moderation um, where we appear to be maybe falling a little bit short right now. Okay. Good to know. Um, another one, this one specifically comes to you. When will they be rolling out the government ID checker thing, checker thingy? Um, that's still being looked at. Um, I do, we don't have a, you know, a, a rollout date or anything. Um, as you can tell, you know, sometimes things here at the lab are kind of like government work. It takes a long time to get through the process and to, to get it fully investigated and get everybody's opinion on it. We're really trying to be careful when we do stuff like that. Um, so as of right now, no, nothing concrete. Um, it is still um, under consideration though. What is the government ID checker thingy? Um, I think it was, I can't remember where it was mentioned. Was it mentioned at town hall? Um, was it, it was, it was mentioned somewhere in a lab gap or in a town hall um, that we were looking at, you know, a, a means of age verification. Okay. All right. Um, one more. Kenny, Kenny Lex Luckless asks, what does the TOS say about handling and maintaining a dead friend's account? If it, pushes you over the limits for accounts that you already have. That's to Kira as well. So in terms of pushing you over the number of accounts, um, no, that's not going to be a factor in it. Um, but we do have a way and we do sometimes, you know, suggest and I will go find the wiki page because we do have a wiki page on it. Um, you can bequeath your um, your accounts um, and your land to somebody via an official will. Um, and sometimes we, you know, we suggest that, you know, if you have a substantial investment in Second Life and you want to protect that and pass it on to, you know, a family member or, you know, your business partner, um, it's, it's a good idea to get that set up and set up. A, I know it's super morbid to think about writing a will. Um, I mean, I, I just, there it is. Thanks, Skylar and Tommy. You guys go both at the same time. Um, it's, you know, unfortunately, one of those things that we need to think about, but there is a way to kind of protect what you built here in Second Life and leave that legacy still intact by, um, you know, putting it in your will and leaving it for somebody. It's never too early to make up a will. It's always a good idea. Just have it there in your back pocket. Unfortunately. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. Patch, I have a question for you. Visha Verwood asks, have premium plan gifts fallen by the wayside and only moved to premium plus? Oh, no, not at all. Um, I know we haven't done one in a little while, but uh, it's on the radar. Um, I was thinking about that uh, just recently, and um, I know we're a little behind on getting some stuff out to premium folks, and uh, I think you'll be pleased to know that we've got some stuff coming. All right, here's another question for you, Patch. 
where do you see Second Life in 10 years time? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I, I think Second Life will continue to, to, to thrive. And, um, you know, I think through our efforts um, with, you know, mobile, um, even our spice, spicy initiatives that we're working on uh, to come, um, our future plans for more homes and more content and infrastructure and creation tools, um, modernization of the content system and pipeline, you know, are, are setting us up for, you know, a great next, not just 10 years, but 20 years, you know, of modernizing and, uh, you know, making the necessary improvements uh, to Second Life to en endure that. Um, you know, so um, I hope that we're all here and continue to be part of it and uh, see its see its success and um, you know continue to be a very important part of uh, many people's lives. I'm already thinking about themes for SL30B, so we will definitely be here in ten years' time. <laughs> Derek, a question from Liberty Fairlander. Will Linden Lab do something about real estate agents who are grabbing up the best Belisarian parcels and renting them out to non-premium members? We can walk along the coastlines of some of the regions and see home after home taken by residents with names that are almost exactly identical and are being used by other people. It Turn, it's turning the coastlines into Anchi Chung like operation of Belisaria. This is really actually fascinating to hear. Um, the uh, the short answer is yes, uh, we absolutely will do something. Uh, we just need to be aware of who is doing it. Um, it is, uh, I believe, actually close to, if not the top uh, top line of the the Linden Home, uh, the Belisaria. Uh, covenant that states that you cannot sublease uh, parcels. So if this is happening, uh, we definitely want to hear about it. Uh, and please file an abuse report so that we can uh, get that addressed. Again, the importance of abuse reports. <laughs> Kira, a question for you from Bella Tolson. I wish to ask about the AR of things we see against the Linden Homes Covenant, like outside parcel, out of theme. Is there a priority on the focus on the faults or some themes that are being more excusable than others? Lately, it takes longer than before to fix clear covenant abuses. Many taller than covenant allow many taller than covenant allow add-ons are being sold on the marketplace as well. You know, there's so much about abuse reports and governance. I would love to tell everybody, um, but I can't. Um, but um, for this particular issue, you know, anytime we get a report in, it's it, the system will will kind of automatically triage it and put it in kind of a severity order, right? So that, <clears throat> sorry, um, so that the the more egregious um, violations are are you know first we get the, the, those get our attention like right away. Um, so we do go through those, um, the covenant ones, they may take a little bit longer for us to get to, um, but we do, we do get through those as well. Um, in terms of the, the items that are being sold on the marketplace, I, you know, you, you can sell whatever you want. Um, and it's, you know, kind of a, if, if you're buying it, you know, you gotta be aware that it might not be something that you can put on a Linden home region. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, we, we do go through all of those and, and we do review them as soon as we can. All right, good to know. Um, Patch, a couple of questions for you from Skylar Pancake. Are there any active efforts at making Linden Lab more accessible to all users by creating or promoting tools such as text to voice and voice to text services? Uh, yeah, actually, this question came up yesterday to product and engineering. Um, there, there is, and they are working on it um, actively, and uh, it's part of the project where they're working on server-side translation. Um, there isn't a, a, a timeline or an ETA on 
uh, the voice side of it because I know that there's some other uh, things in the work there works there around voice. So I don't want to misspeak and misrepresent the team and what they said yesterday, but they did talk about it yesterday. And um, I do know it's something that they are actively working on. All right, I, I do know that we talked about that some yesterday. So it does definitely seem like it's something that is in their sights. There have been numerous questions about the SL20B sweepstakes car from last year and who won that. Pat, can you tell us anything more about that? Um, yeah, so it was won. Um, that much I can share with you. Uh, the state in which the person won the car uh, had the legal option to remain anonymous and not uh, and or choose to not be disclosed. So they did so. Um, yeah, no, I did not win it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, interestingly enough, um, congratulations to them, even though uh, nobody is uh, unfortunately allowed to know who they are. But, um, yeah, it certainly was one, and uh, it was pretty cool. Very exciting. Okay, so the question from the audience, last question that I have here is, are all of you sitting around a conference table answering, participating in this town hall, or are you all at home talking into uh, your headsets? Well, I can go first. I'm sitting in the Atlanta office talking into my headset at my desk. I really wish I was at home, but I am not. I'm in the Atlanta office as well. <laughs> Derek, Enjoy. where are you? Uh, I am connecting from the Moon Lab uh, from uh, Texas. And I'm joining the bandwagon with Patch and Kira coming from my desk in the Atlanta office. So all three of you are in the Atlanta office, but you're all sitting in separate rooms. Correct. Yep, we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're anti-social. That, so that way we don't, uh, well, and it makes it so that way we don't uh, echo in each other's headsets. That's true. That's true. So I want to know more about the Moon Lab. The Moon Lab is a fantastic place. Uh, so actually, it's uh, it, here at Linden Lab, uh, we, of course, do have a split between in-office employees and uh, remote employees. Uh, we refer to our remote employees as Moon Labbers. Cool. I did not know that. All right. Well. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, Patch, Kira, Derek, and Izzy, it's been a joy talking to you. The audience has been great. We've enjoyed all the questions that you've sent in to us. Um, thank you so much for coming. Tomorrow, Philip Rosedale will be here. Brett Linden will be interviewing him, doing a Q&A session with him. And it will be right here at the Aquatorium um, tomorrow at, you can come and sit down at 1 p.m. SLT. Same bat time, same bat channel. Hope to Thank see you, you all students. here. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. And thank, thank you, everyone. You,